after a while, because I'd done so much research on drugs, I was asked by the British government to help them think through drug policy. Well, actually, that was that was not true. They asked me to help them justify drug policy. But when I started working for them, I realized that the drug policy wasn't in any way evidence based. And, and when I tried to bring evidence to bear on drug policy, they sacked me because, it, because it's much more convenient to have a political decision making about drugs than it is to have an, an evidence based one. What year was that that you got involved in that? Well, I started working on the principles of assessing drug harms really back in the 1990s. And it actually came with the rise of ecstasy and, and, the, and people supposedly, well, seemingly getting harmed from ecstasy. And I, I, I was one of, the, one of the experts who was asked by the government to come up with a policy which would reduce the harms from ecstasy. And it became very clear when we were researching those that the harms of ecstasy aren't from the drug at all. They're actually from the uh, what you do when you're on the drug. They're either from the fact you dehydrate because you dance all night, uh, or you over over you, you get hypothermic because you're in an environment where you can't cool down. And so we said, and actually we brought in a, what in legislation in Britain, which said any club which is serving drinks, which is where most people were going to have their ecstasy, they're going to clubs, they must serve free water. Because what the clubs were doing were actually forcing people to drink alcohol uh, or pay for water in order to, to to get hydrated after using ecstasy, and that and so, and in fact they were doing worse. They were turning off the taps in the. They were even turning off the toilet so people couldn't drink water. So we we made it law that people had to get access to water, and we also recommended a good policy would be to have chill out rooms. And of course, a lot of clubs do have chill out rooms, and those just those two simple. Um, environmental approaches effectively, you know, very, very few deaths from ecstasy since then, until we've got to the modern day when a variety of international policies have now made ecstasy considerably more harmful than it used to be. How much did this coincide with or follow in lockstep with drug policy in the United States, which really seemed to um, get a get a real boost in the arm in the early 80s? Um, was, was the UK leading or following? Oh, every country in the world follows you. The United, Nation, United Nations is, up to, and probably still is, paid for by the US, and it does what the US tells them. Our, every single British lo drug law until 2016 was made at the behest of the Americans. So, you know, America basically, you know, you know what they say, America sneezes, the world catches cold. America defined drug policy. It started in 1934 with the, the, the attack on, you know, the liberalization of drinking and the attack on cannabis. And it continued. And I mean, of course, the big inflection was when Nixon decided to, that the war on drugs was actually a better vote getter than the war in Vietnam. So he switched people's attention to drugs. And, and you know, the world has been fighting a war on drugs largely funded, but certainly politically driven by America since then. So let's talk a little bit about the framework through which one can think about drugs. Um, I, I'm a framework junkie. I, everything I think about, whether it's, you know, how to order dinner comes down to sort of a framework. Um, so, so what, you know, some parameters that people might think of, right, are, you know, how harmful is this? And again, you know, the, I think the goal of frameworks is to have them be as unemotional as possible and to have them, when, whenever possible, to be objective. Um, so, so how harmful is something would be part of it. How addictive is something? What's the physiologic dependence? Um, and then even within harm, you could sort of talk about the harm to the individual and then the harm to society as that individual acts. Are there any other things you would include or do those three things largely encompass what you think of as, as, a, as a good way to think about molecules? Well, that's, yeah, that that's, uh, is quite a succinct way. So I started off with something somewhat similar to that. Uh, but more recently, we've developed what's called multi-criteria decision analysis. And it turns out actually there are 16 different ways in which drugs can do harm. There are nine harms to the user and there are seven harms to society. And the societal harms range from international damage, you know, like the US spraying Agent Orange in, you know, in Colombia to kill, to kill cocoa plants, through to economic damage, through to health costs, through to damage to families, etc. So there's seven harms to society and nine harms to the user. And each of those can, you can scale drugs on each of those uh, 
those uh, 16 scales of parameters of harm. And if you do all that and put it all together and, and then do a weighting, because obviously not every single one of those scales is equally important. If you do all that, then um, you, you can actually very, very transparently and, and very reliably rate the harms of different drugs. And, and we've used this procedure in Britain, we've used it in Europe, and most recently in Australia. And pretty much all the drugs always rank the same in all those, you know, those three sort of groups of Western um, jurisdictions. So based on that type of a framework, what are the drugs that consistently come to the top of the list in terms of harm, aggregate harm? So the most harmful drug overall in all in, in Europe, in Britain, in Australia is, is alcohol. And alcohol is the most harmful drug because it's, it has way more social impact, more harms to others than any other drug. And that, of course, is because it's much more widely used. You know, 80% of American adults and British adults drink alcohol. Pretty much every family in your country and my country knows someone that's been harmed by alcohol, either through them, themselves getting into difficulties, having accidents, getting addicted, or they've been harmed by other ones, someone who's drunk or drunk driver or, or someone who's drunk and violent. But if you look at the harm to the user, alcohol's not number one, alcohol's about number four. The drugs which are really harm to the, harmful to the user are opiates, uh, crack, uh, uh, crack cocaine, and also crystal meth. So th that's super interesting, right? Because those drugs have very different scheduling, right? So, so heroin would be a schedule one drug, correct? Cocaine would be a schedule two drug. I guess crystal meth would be schedule one or would it be schedule two in the US? I'm not sure in the, in, in, the, in Britain it's one, but I'm, I think I'm not sure in the US to be honest. And then of course, alcohol is not even scheduled in that sense. It's regulated only by the age at which you can legally consume it. And also by taxation. In right. So um, what we didn't talk about was tobacco. Where, does tobacco fit into this framework? Yeah, tobacco. Yeah, we always do tobacco because tobacco is, <laughs> this is an interesting paradox. When we first did this, we, tobacco came out at about number six or seventh. And the tobacco, anti-tobacco brigade got really agitated. They say it is the most harmful drug because it kills more people. And we said, yeah, but it, that's right. It kills more people, but they often die in their 50s and 60s. Alcohol is killing people in their 20s. And that's more important, we think. Our valuation was that, that the harms of alcohol is considerably greater than the harms of tobacco. And uh, I think most people would agree that you know, tobacco does, in the end, kill half of the people who smoke. But it does it later in life. And uh, it doesn't. tobacco also ca causes relatively little damage to other people, unlike alcohol. I mean, this is such an interesting question, and I, I don't even know how one would think about it because um, you could also take the flip side, which is there's probably nobody who's benefited from tobacco. I, I shouldn't say that. There is a yes. benefit to no, no, tobacco, no. which is that probably it helps some people calm down. It probably helps cope with nerves, but there's no moderate use of tobacco. Like smoking only 10 cigarettes a day is protective. Um, or the harm doesn't really kick in until you're at a pack a day. No, that's not really true. Any amount of tobacco is going to, to take some toll on your pulmonary system and your cardiovascular system. Alcohol, conversely, you could say, well, look, a person who drinks responsibly, who has, you know, three drinks a week, bears no cost of the consumption of alcohol from a relative standpoint. I mean, we could debate that. I, I would argue that there's no dose of alcohol that's healthy, but there are probably doses that don't rise to the level of, of toxicity. Yet to your point, um, it's much easier to cross the line to into acute toxicity, which also gets to another challenge here. Tobacco has no acute toxicity. It's 100% chronic toxicity. Alcohol has both acute toxicity and chronic toxicity. And it's that acute toxicity that results in incredible loss of life, both to the individual and to society. Does the framework allow yes. you to, to measure these things? Yes, it does. Yes, we can give you absolute ratings and rankings on both of those variables, acute toxicity versus uh, chronic toxicity. And of course, you know, the drugs which really do badly on both are the opiates, which can kill you instantly when you take them, but also kill you quite quickly over time as well. But there is another angle, and that's, I think, an important angle which our analysis doesn't um, bring in because it's, it's difficult and challenging. And I'd love to, and, you know, maybe at some point we can do this. And that's the benefits. 
the, the you, you pointed out quite clearly that generally tobacco doesn't bring many benefits. It, nicotine is a funny drug, though. It's the only drug we know of that both calms people but also improves attention. And, and so there are, you know, people who smoke, you know, generally, although they're addicted, they do get a, ben- a benefit, at least uh, when the nicotine's in the brain. But alcohol has a much broader kind of social, I mean, alcohol is one of the most social drugs. I mean, after ecstasy, it probably is the most social drug. And that's why people use it. So there, so there are unquestionably psychological or social benefits from alcohol. And that goes back for sin. Well, that goes back. That goes back to pre-Christian times. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. You know, you've got you know Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Why? Because wine was what the Jews used to celebrate weddings, and it's been used ever since. We all use it. We still use it today to celebrate. So, so alcohol has this very powerful pro-social effect, which I think is why it's so widely used and why it's been. Apart from that little aberration of American prohibition, why it's actually been stable in our society for for many millennia. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.